نجوم لاحت في العليا لتناجي العزة والسؤدد وبريق يصطع أخاذا ونفوس الناس بها تسعد Uh, welcome to Mad Islam. Uh, my name is Stephen R. Moore. And my guest today will be Farah Prudence. Uh, she is an ex-Muslim. And we're going to discuss, uh, you know, Islam and the lives of Sharia. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, how the Muslim Brotherhood has infiltrated our own government here in the United States and many other things. Farah, why did... Why did you become an ex-Muslim? And how, moving forward, does that affect you now as you go to the polls and vote? My journey in becoming an ex-Muslim was uh, a pretty short one, actually. And it started out like so many other ex-Muslims um, in my efforts to become a devout Muslim and to understand Allah and to follow Muhammad's footsteps, I saw the deceit and I saw the danger and I saw the uh, injustice that is the basic of Islam's or Islam's teachings. So when I was uh, 10 years old, about 10 years old, I was actually seeking approval of my father, like every other child. And so I decided that maybe if I become a devout Muslim, then he will actually uh, approve of me and, and he would start to show some love. And uh, of course I started to wear the hijab and I uh, started to read the Quran. I started to pray five times a day. I started to really study the Sunnah and the Sirah, which are the teachings from Muhammad. Um, and quite honestly, I got physically ill. And I, you know, my hair started falling out. I started getting night sweats, nightmares. Mm. It just everything was was starting to manifest physically. And, and it didn't take me long to get to that point. I mean, I was in the chapter about the cow. It's called the chapter of the cow, Surah right. Al-Baqarah, which is the second book, if you will. It's the second chapter in the Quran after the opening Surah Al-Fatiha. And in, in that chapter, it talks about, you know, behead, you know, slice the necks of the non-believers. Right. And I started to look into this more and figure out how could it possibly be that Allah, who's always, I've been taught that he's so merciful. Muhammad is so merciful. Muhammad is, is the moral, he's the essence of a moral compass. He is the most best moral person in the world, right? The best example of morality that he went ahead and killed people after he had already won the battle, literally lined up men, men, right? Anybody showing signs of puberty is a man, right? Um, any male showing signs of puberty, you get killed. So I was like, you know what? Uh, no, this is not for me. This is not something I'm, I'm willing to follow. If Allah and Muhammad are the right path, I'd rather go to hell than actually right. follow them. But of course, at this point, I understood that the cost of leaving Islam, even as a 10 year old is death. So I kept it to myself. Um, and I just kind of went through the motions, kept fasting and doing whatever I needed to do to just basically make sure that nobody knows what I that I'm done um, until I actually got the ch chance to come back here to the West and, and get my freedom. And how does that affect me in the polls? Uh, it is very important to me. I mean, it's the number two issue. Number, I would say it's equal to the number two issue. So the number one issue for me is pro-life. Right. Um, if somebody is not pro-life, then chances are probably not going to vote for them. The right. second issue, are it's tied between the Second Amendment and Sharia compliance. If a right. candidate has got their pockets lined in any way, shape, or form with CARE, the OIC, ISNA, any of those organizations, I would never vote for them. Um, and my second issue is, of course, the Second Amendment as well. If anybody's anti-gun, it's just not going to happen. So the, it, it's really just cut and dry. It's, it's, right. that, it's that cut and dry for me. In, in your answer for the first question, I believe that brings us to the second question. Um, you know, what do you think in your, your own terms, um, it, uh, you know, are the dangers of letting in people like, well, you know, letting people like, uh, you know, that are involved with heavily with care uh, into, you know, Congress and, you know, letting them affect policy more, uh, you know, letting people that are actually members of CARE into, uh, you know, you know, Congress as like a congressman or a congresswoman. 
Um, what, are, what are your thoughts about that? And what do, what do you think the dangers are of letting those people take control? Well, we already saw that happening. So aside from my opinion, we can see some facts of what happened. Um, at best, one of the ex-directors of the FBI was a Muslim sympathizer. There's a lot of word out that he was actually a Muslim, but I'm not going to go there. Let's say he was a Muslim sympathizer, that he was PC. And we saw what he did um, with the FBI. He scrubbed right. all of the records of the FBI, all of the training materials from any reference to jihad, Islam, Al-Quran, um, anything that has to do with bringing the issue back to what this terrorism actually is. And right. that, of course... Uh, it, it literally disables our really dedicated um, FBI agents from being able to do right. their job. It right. the completely guys, disables. There are still good guys in the FBI, right? <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. But. Absolutely. There are, I know a few of them and they are fantastic. I've known, I've worked with them in Iraq and they are just amazing people, but you know, they've got these chains on their hands and their wrists and, and they can't do anything because of all of this PC bureaucracy. But, um, so that's what happened with the FBI. But when you look at Congress, look at uh, members like Keith Ellison, for example, Good example. that's a huge red flag. Their loyalty is not to the United States of America. Their no. loyalty is to Islam. Now, this right. isn't something that I'm making up. Any devout Muslim that puts their hand on the Quran in order to swear on it, um, Sharia, Allah says, do not take the infidels or the non-believers as allies, literally. It's in the Quran. It's the literal right. word of Allah. Um, so, so that's pretty dangerous. When you talk about care, a lot of people think that care is a civil rights movement, which or a civil and a civil rights. Um, <laughs> right. Right. And it's not a civil rights group. Care is an unindicted co-conspirator in the Holy Land Foundation. And it, it, I was talking to a friend about this, and she actually thought that unindicted co-conspirator means that they were found innocent. I was like, oh, no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> opposite. It right. means that there was so much evidence against them that they need their own trial. And right. if it wasn't for our traitor in chief Obama, they, that trial would have gone through. And I'm hoping to see President Trump bring that back up with Jeff Sessions and really yeah. go after them. Well, so I, I kind of have a little bit of distrust myself with Jeff Sessions, but we won't get into that. <laughs> hey, yeah. Jeff Sessions, my issue with him is that he's been going after the weed instead of going after Hillary Clinton. But I, I heard recently that that might be changing. So hopefully we'll, we'll see some real work out of Jeff Sessions. But I'm so glad that you asked that, Stephen, because look at Michigan. In about 73 or 74 days, Michigan is going to be going to the polls. And they might be voting in the first Muslim governor in the United States of America. And now this guy, Abdul Sayyid, is yep. so freaking dangerous. Um, not only is he Sharia compliant, his wife is Sharia compliant, uh, but he's got strong ties to people like Linda Sarsour, who actually promoted him and is endorsing him. She is Hamas's little baby girl. Okay? Oh, yeah. Um, Care loves him and is pushing him. Not only that, in a recent talk with uh, another candidate, Patrick Kolbeck, I think his name is, he actually, yeah. uh, Mr. Kolbeck was coming out and saying that he has concerns about his Sharia compliance. We already know that girls are undergoing FGM, female genital mutilation in Michigan. We all know the state of Michigan doesn't need FGM done on it. And that's what's going to happen after, if Abdul Sayyid becomes governor. But he's asking him these questions saying that he has concerns about the Sharia side of it. And Abdul comes out and, of course, calls him a racist and a bigot, never actually a answering these questions. And at the end, he says this, and, and I hope we can play the clip after this, but he says, yeah. you may not hate Muslims, but Muslims, Muslims hate, hate you. you. And what I have not heard is the Republicans on this panel decisively and swiftly call out this kind of Islamophobia this kind of racism in the context, right, that they are running to represent a state that has the highest per capita number of Muslim Americans in the country. Now, you might not hate racist Muslims, but I'll tell you, Muslims definitely hate you. Yep, I, I remember seeing the clip, and I was actually even surprised uh, that he would even be so bold as to say something yes. like that. Um, it's it's you know, Shadia in a nutshell, isn't it, Stephen? Right, right. And me and, like, me and you, we know, like, who, who Asid is. 
than who what he actually represents. But most right. people have this like are fooled by this thin veil of like politeness and you know uh, false allegations of racism towards people like you and me, um, which right. is you know, just a joke um, because they can put all the labels they want to on us. But at the end of the day, um, I, I, I kind of love it when they do things like like C did and say things like that, because then it's like the veil's off and you see, yeah. you know, the monster beneath. So, uh, you know, it, it's just, it, you know, but moving forward, you know, it, it's, I, I'm hoping that gives the other candidate, what's his name again? Patrick Kolbeck. Patrick Kolbeck. I, I remember following him on social media. Uh, the guy needs a chance. Michigan, you know, get out there to the polls. Make sure that you vote for him. A seed is basically a radical. You could call it a radical. Um, yeah. I kind of tend to call them fundamentalist or extremist um, because, you know, as Farah is aware too, um, Farah is more of the expert. I am kind of more of I would say proficient, but when it comes to Islam, um, you know, I am no stranger myself either, but you know, it's people like a seed. And I think I'm saying his name, right? Um, Sayyid. Sayyid. I actually, I don't know if it's Sayyid or is Sayyid from the way it's yeah, written, but yeah. I think it's Sayyid. But, uh, you know, people like him, uh, you know, I, I'm just hoping that the people of Michigan will not be, I guess, to the point is uh, the people of Michigan will not be fooled. Um, you know, the, I'm sure you see what's going on in your community. Uh, you know, don't let somebody like that take control because they're gonna make it 10 times worse. If you think it's bad now, they're gonna make it worse. And right. honestly, you know, before we go to the next question, um, I wanna thank you, Farah, for doing some of the recent work that you've done out in uh, Michigan too. Every year in America, there are at least 27 honor killings. There are thousands of honor violence cases and dozens of girls undergoing FGM, female genital mutilation. I wish I could show you the faces, but here are some names that I want you to think of the next time someone says we should accept and respect all cultures and religions. Tahani Mansour. Tahani was in her 20s. She was a pharmacist in Ohio, a beautiful young lady who committed the great crime of having a messy room and dating a non-Muslim. Her father went up to her when she was sleeping in her bed and shot her in the head twice. You were so brave. I saw the interview uh, that you did that day and I think the work that you are doing is top notch, really. Thank and you. you know, you're really doing a service to your country. So I, you know, I commend your bravery. So, but Thanks that's enough me. ranting for me. <laughs> we'll go, uh, <laughs> go on to the next question. You know, moving forward from that, if we could possibly, you know, avert this crisis of getting people like I, I see into office and people like that, which I have a whole list actually of candidates uh, running if, if people would like to know. Um, it, it's, I actually even listed it in my book um, but, uh, shameless plug, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's something that we need to take very seriously, but moving forward, uh, again, to the next question, uh, is, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, crisis averted from getting these people, these, these bad people in office? What are your thoughts on the political, uh, landscape in general in this country? Do you think, you know, uh, seeing things from your eyes, uh, do we still have hope? Is there, can we still, you know, stop this march to go towards Sharia and this, this lawlessness that we see uh, going on in our political atmosphere? What are, what are your thoughts about that? Do you think that we oh. still have a chance at saving our, our, our nation? Right. Well, I'm, I'm a devout Christian, as a lot of people know. And so I think I there's always hope in Christ. And I'm not saying that to be cheesy. And I know it's kind of overused, but I know that if you serve God with the gifts that you have, um, and you go out there and seize the opportunities that he's presenting you with, and you don't sit on your knees and pray all day, then we will, we can definitely get somewhere. Um, the church in America has failed. Yes, they have. Pastors, priests, deacons, whatever you want to refer to yourself. 
um, they have failed in general terms. Um, they are flocking more towards, and I say they, most of them are flocking more towards the interfaith dialogues that are a huge scam. Um, and instead of going towards warning their people, warning their flocks, protecting their flocks from the danger that is coming in. I mean, I hear pastors talking. I'm like, you obviously don't even know who Jesus is. If you confuse and say that we worship the same God, I don't care if you have a PhD in theology, you don't know crap. You don't know Jesus. So that's the basic. We have to start at the basics. The corruption in the government is just really a reflection of how corrupted we are on the basic lines. Um, look at government and policies, really. One single policy, one single law can overturn this entire tide. If we recognize the Muslim Brotherhood in this country as a terrorist organizations, right. organization, you're going to see as it has been recognized in several Islamic countries like right. Egypt and the United Arab Emirates, you are going to see mosques getting shut down left and right. You're going to see imams and sheikhs in prison. You're going to see people like Abdul Sayyid and his wife in prison. You're going to see people like Linda Sarsour in prison. Uh, right. And you're going to see care shut down, the OIC, ISNA, all of it. There's going to be FBI raids all over the place. We're not going to have enough prison room for what's going to happen here in the United States. You're going to see people with the Black Panthers, Keith Ellison, whose pockets have been lined up and down by Hamas. Um, the nation of Islam. <laughs> we can just, <laughs> you know, the nation of Islam with, with Farrakhan. Right. They're going to go to prison. That one law that one recognition, Stephen, could turn the tide upside down. But that's not going to happen until we, the people, decide that, no, we are culturally superior because guess what? We don't cut our daughters. We do not murder our daughters. We do not force them to marry other people. Until we start taking pride in who we are and realize that we are right and righteous and we stop submitting to the darkness, it's not going to happen because government, like I said, is a reflection of the people. Right, right. And I'm glad you bring up that point because that's – one of the main points in, and I'm going to do a shameless plug, sorry, but Go uh, for it. <laughs> in my book, uh, Blue Collar Revolution, a Call to Act that just came out uh, a couple weeks ago, that is the main point is that we need a call to act. We need to, as just regular everyday people, get involved because one of the points I make to people all the time is that you can't change things for the better if all you do is complain. You have to be engaged. You have to be involved. It's hard. I, I get that all the time. Well, it's hard. I work night shift. I work 10, 12 hours a day. Okay. Well, night. And I do political activism and I do national security activism via uh, Act for America, by the way. Uh, but, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's along those same lines as what you were saying that it's, it's, you know, it's, it's past the point of time for people to rise up in a, a revolutionary way that is not violent in a way that's, that, like you were saying, that shows that we are better than the other side. So definitely some, some very good points. there. Thank you. Uh, for, for answering oh, the questions. You've got to send me a copy of your book too. I didn't know it was already. Definitely. definitely. You've got to send me a copy of that. I love it. It's, <laughs> it's so hard. Of course it's hard. It's never been easy. You know, when our forefathers fought in the Revolutionary War to take what is theirs, it wasn't easy. No. They had to be away from their wives and their husbands and their children for years upon years. And they didn't have FaceTime back then. They didn't have phone calls. Like they do. Um, they put their fortunes on the line. They put their reputations on the line. They put their lives on the line. Right. So don't talk to me about, it's not easy. It's hard. You know, I am a, <laughs> I'm a wife, a mom. I'm trying to get my ministry up on its feet. And I try to do this work all at the same time while battling all kinds of other stuff in the background. <laughs> and it's not easy, but no. it is so worth it. it. Right. Gotcha. Definitely. Uh, you know, that's kind of one of the things that makes me rest my head a little easier uh, when I can, uh, is that th I know for a fact that the work I'm doing at the end of the day is meaningful. And, you know, however hard it may be, uh, 
you know, that, that should be, you know, your driving point. Once you start getting involved and engaged, you realize that it's, it's not just like the meaning, meaningless, oh, got to go to work every day kind of thing. It's the, right. this is purposeful stuff that, you know, like you were saying before, like, for instance, if we get the Muslim Brotherhood designated as a terrorist organization, there will be so many dominoes that fall. Who would not want to be part of something like that? You know, who doesn't want to be a part of getting rid of corruption in our government? Who doesn't want to be a part of that? You know, so to all the naysayers out there that, that want to demonize us for what we do, you know, what are you doing? You know, for the people that complain, what are you doing to make a change besides complain? You know, so definitely, um, you know, but as, as far as like when you were talking about people like Keith Ellison, he, that man is more dangerous than people realize. Let me tell you, yeah. I could do a whole nother video on him. Uh, you know, but there's also people like in my state, Pennsylvania, we have somebody like Palm Wolf and Casey, who I'm not sure if you're aware, have also been involved with care. So Tom Wolf's name is, is, is bringing red lights to my brain. And I think I have a dossier on him somewhere on my computer. <laughs> Uh, he's, he's a, he's a very, uh, how should we say this politely, a nefarious individual. Um, I've actually experienced, uh, you know, I, I did a rally last year to kind of make my point with him. Uh, it was called March Against Sharia. It was a national thing. Didn't get a lot of media coverage, uh, but we went out there and we did it across the nation. Um, and in, you know, the group that showed up in protest, in counter protest, was Antifa. Now, long story short, a member of Antifa had stabbed a state policeman's horse while they were there. So, yeah, and there's news articles out there to prove my point. It, it, it happened. It was, it was horrible. Um, now, luckily, the horse, Samson was his name, uh, survived fine, uh, praise God. Uh, but in, in after all this craziness happened there that day, I, I, you know, after everything cooled down and simmered down, I started making phone calls and emails to law enforcement. Um, this was right before their activities uh, were deemed as terrorist activities um, from the DHS and the FBI, which I'm proud to have taken a part of that. Um, but I wish we could get the whole group designated that way. Uh, but anyway... I had made phone calls, emails to like Tom Wolf, Casey, you know, all, all the legislators in PA uh, to say, you know, hey, can we take the page out of New Jersey's book, okay, and incorporate it here where we can go after this group because they're violent, they're, they're anti-cop, they're, they're pro-Sharia, you know, right. they're, so they're, they're terrorists. And so, you know, can we go after them? Well, I call Tom Wolf's office, okay, and get this. When I asked them if they, first of all, know who Antifa is, their first response to me was laughter and saying, we know who they are. As if to say to me, you know, this is how I interpreted it. As if to say, we know who they are. What are you going to do about it? We know that they have ties to ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Muslim Brotherhood. We know that they have ties to the Democrats, mostly. I haven't discovered any Republicans that are involved with Antifa, but I've definitely discovered Democrats that have. You know, Keith Ellison, we know about that. Um, you know, Tom Wolf, I would say, is definitely a go for that. But, you know, there's others also, you know, like Hillary has financial ties to, to them, okay? So it's like, it's this spiral of corruption. And it's just right. like, again, you know, to our, to your point and to my point with these questions, which are very, you know, they were meant to be loaded questions. Uh, you know, it, it's just that it's, it's to raise an alarm. That's what, that's what your work's about. That's what my work's about. What Act for America's work is about, um, you know, and many of the ex-Muslims out here that I'm so proud to know you and, and some of the other people that I know that are ex-Muslims that are so brave and out and making a stand. Uh, but you know, it, it's, it's the raising the alarm to, to let people know that, hey, we're not gonna go down without a fight. This nation's not gonna go down without a fight. 
And if you think it is, good luck. <laughs> so uh, what Sorry. would you say as, as maybe your words of encouragement uh, for like, especially like the younger generation, um, you know, that maybe doesn't know some of the things that we know of the dangers of letting Islam into our country too. Um, what would you say as advice to people that are uneducated in, in that respect? Well, that is so important because I think one of the reasons that Antifa has arise um, and that communism seems to be cool these days is that our young generation, and I say young generation, but I am a millennial. <laughs> um, they... <laughs> We are so thirsty for something to believe in. We are yearning for principles, yearning. And guess who's there to fill that void? The left. They're the wrong. left has They're been wrong. there to fill that void and to give it up. And again, this is a failure on the part of the church. The church did not step up to be able to talk to these, to our generation and to really bring us into not just the church, but I'm talking about the conservative, the right side of the equation. So if right, just having most of the millennials that I know, right? yeah, most of the millennials that I know who are libertarians, which I am a libertarian, are libertarians because they think weed is cool. And I think that's what being a libertarian is about. And it is not about that. I mean, that's kind of part of it is is being able to put whatever you want in your body is, I believe in that. You're free to do that. You probably shouldn't, but that's a topic for another time. Um, but it is so important to be able to offer them something to believe in. And now that somebody else has stepped up to the plate and has filled their noggins with the absolute literal rubbish, it, it's, it's, going to take a lot more work to be able to counter that. And I was having a conversation with a young man a few weeks ago at my chiropractor's office. And um, he told me, he, he's in university, and he actually told me, he said, I have a friend who, who's a Muslim who's wearing the hijab, you know, but, but she's not, you know, and he's a Christian guy raised in a good family. She's, mm. she's not, you know, a radical kind of Muslim. She just wears it because it's cultural. Mm. She says that it's cultural. Wow. Listen to how dangerous that sentence is. Right. It's cultural. Yes, it's cultural. Yeah. It is cultural because Islam is not a religion. Exactly. It's a complete way of life. So you can say that Islam is a culture. You can say that Islam is a legal system. Islam is a theocracy. Of course it's cultural because Islam right. is a culture uh, and it mandates it. And of course it tries to use religious mandates to be able to push it on people. Now, this is where... He doesn't have anywhere to go to and ask. It just so happens that he saw me at the office and he was talking to me about it. Um, but other than that, if he turns to the church, most of the churches are saying, we pray to one God and they are our brothers and our sisters. Okay, well, that makes it okay. Well, he's going to keep those blindfolds on. He's not going to be able to see anything unless he actually goes out of his way to try and do some research and find out the truth. And this is what I always say. Don't take my word for it. Go and do the research. I will recommend books. Exactly. I will warn you of the sugar-coated, dipped in maple syrup, Islamic websites that like to twist and turn words and not translate it quite accurately right. and say, well, this is just for then. It's not for now. Um, I will tell you that. But at the end of the day, we need to give people a chance to know. And we need to try to invest in, in our children and our neighbors. If we don't get up and we start doing the legwork, if we don't get up and stop being afraid of being called bigots and racists and lose people, I've lost, <laughs> I've lost so many friendships that never even started because of what I do. Because Me too. <laughs> people are like, oh, well, you have a powerful testimony, and, uh, but we're just too different. Mm hmm like, okay, wow. no problem. I'm not going to stop telling the truth because it makes me unpopular yeah. or because it makes me uh, whatever it is that you want to call me, whether it's a racist, a bigot, a xenophobe, whatever it is, I've been called, <laughs> I've been called a lot worse than anybody can ever think. So uh, that's, that's pretty important. And we need to just be available for people right. when they're asking questions and provide them a good direction to go into and again, go back to the truth. Let's go back yeah. to basics. What is America? What is the constitution? What is the bill of rights? Cause you can't really go much further if you don't have the basics, right? Right. Definitely. Um, yeah. Well, it, and I think that's a, 
a definite good answer. I think that's a uh, some definitely good advice, uh, especially you know for the younger generation. Um, you know, and, and to your point, um, wrapping this up, you know, the truth, however inconvenient or however unpopular it is, sometimes it just needs to be said. So I would totally agree with you. You know, sometimes, you know, the truth may not be something you want to hear, but it's something that just needs to get out. And, you know, we're at such a, a dire straits point of time in our country right now. You know, again, I, I hate to beat a dead horse, but, you know, it's, it's just, it's incumbent on us all to start talking about these things, you know, um, you know, coming up, I want to do more of these type of interviews uh, with different um, ex-Muslims as well. I have a couple pretty good people lined up, just like yourself, um, that are, you know, standing for the truth, um, most of which are that are female, I've noticed. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of inspiring, especially to me as a male, uh, to see that there are such warriors for the truth like yourself that are female it's like to me i, I kind of sometimes i sit around and wonder where the males are in this movement to to rise up and say hey you know i'm going to stand with these strong women because they're doing what needs to be done so why aren't we <laughs> that would be incredible but you know what historically and traditionally women are usually the whistleblowers right, right. um i think that's one of the one of the uh, wisdoms of the church, the old church, not the new church, but the old church is having a few priests with several, several nuns. Um, and it's, it's a very smart design because you need a lot of women to keep the guys straight. I mean, yes, that's just the way that it definitely. is. And I'm not, I get, I am not into the toxic masculinity. I love yeah. masculinity because I'm surrounded by amazing men. You know, my husband is a very masculine man and I love his masculinity. It's, it's wonderful. I lavish in it. Um, my, my pastor is an amazing man. Our, we have several pastors that are amazing men and my brother's a great guy. And so in my life, in my world, masculinity is a fantastic thing. So I'm definitely pro, pro, pro guys. But, you know, you're talking about the truth. And I think it was John Stuart Mill in uh, On Liberty. Fantastic, fantastic read. Hmm. Look really, that I think you talked about the truth and how the truth, just because you're telling the truth, it doesn't mean that it will necessarily save you. So if you go out and tell the truth, it has to be for the sake of letting the truth out not for the sake of saving you just because you're Jesus told the truth. That could be the best right. example Jesus told the truth and he was crucified for it. Of exactly. course, John Stuart Mill, I don't believe was Christian. I believe he was, um, he was agnostic. Maybe I'm not sure. I have to read back on that, yeah, I'm not but with him. no, but um, that's the thing. Again, if you're going to tell the truth, it needs to be for the sake of the truth being liberated and set free so that it never dies, not for your own personal glory. Because usually it right. does not happen. That's the complete opposite of what would happen. Yeah, I, you're, you're totally right. I've noticed so many people uh, that attach themselves to like, you know, like the MAGA movement and, and just the movement to make America better and safer. You know, there's so many people out there that just want to make a name for themselves and want to profit off of it instead of doing it for the right reasons. You know, I can tell right. you other than my book that I've published and, and you know, it's really only for informational purposes. It, it wasn't set out to be like a make, make me rich thing thing or anything like that. But you know, it, it's, I, I don't earn a penny from doing what I do. Um, I'm sure you don't either. You know, I, you know, <laughs> it, it's like, you know, all the work that we're doing, is for just what you were just saying, the right reasons, because we care. It's not because we want to get famous or make a name for ourselves. I know myself personally, I, I don't need to be famous. I want the information. I want the knowledge that I have. I want that to be popular, right? I want that to be trendy, okay? Not me, not Stephen Moore. So yeah, with that, I uh, love that. That's 
Thanks for joining us again uh, from At Islam. My name is Stephen Moore, and my very gracious and lovely guest was Farah Prudence. And we'll see you on the next episode. أرجو ملاحة في العليا لتناجي العزة والسؤدة وبريق يصدع أخاذا ونفوس الناس بها تسعد